Hello, I'm Ann Kelly, your moderator for today's live stream virtual event. I'm the Vice President of Government Relations here at Ceres, and we're thrilled to be hosting today's session, Beyond Rhetoric, the Case for Responsible Policy Engagement. I'm thrilled to see so many friends and colleagues on the line today, and I'm thrilled that over 200 of you are listening to this conversation. Ceres is a sustainability nonprofit working with some of the largest, most influential investors and companies from around the world on our greatest global sustainability challenges, including the climate crisis, deforestation, water scarcity and pollution, and just and inclusive economies. Our session today will highlight the role that public policy engagement can play in accelerating action on climate change to mitigate the risks arising from extreme weather events and the low carbon transition. I wanna thank each of you for joining us and I'm gonna be looking forward to your questions and no doubt a robust discussion. I also wanna thank and welcome our speakers and say how much we appreciate their time and their steadfast dedication to tackling the climate challenge. Before we begin, I just have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this session is being recorded and we'll be providing all of you with a link to the recording shortly after its completion. And if you have questions throughout, please pop those into the Q&A box that's located on your control panel. We are gonna do our best to answer each and every one of these. Um, before the end of the session. Some of these may be answered in real time in writing by our panelists and our background staff here. Some of these we will tackle at the end of the session when we will spotlight everyone and open it up for Q&A. So hold on to your seats, let's get going. And now it is my pleasure to introduce today's speakers. First off, we have Marcella Pinella. She is Director of Sustainable Investing at Zevin Asset Management. Welcome to you, Marcella. Next, we have Dominic Gogal, who is Deputy Director of Policy for the We Mean Business Coalition. Welcome to you, Dominic. And finally, my colleague, Yamika Ketu, who is Senior Associate of Climate Governance at Series Accelerator for Capital Markets Program. And Yamika had a tremendous role in putting out our recent RPE benchmarking report. Welcome to you, Yamika. Today's webinar will really consist of three separate sections. We're going to start off with a context setting discussion with Marcella on why investors are so keen to see corporate action on climate lobbying that is specifically aligned with the Paris Agreement, aligned with stated corporate ambitions, crucially important. After that, Yamika will share some of the key findings of our recently released assessment and benchmark, practicing responsible policy engagement. And then we'll move on to a discussion with Dominic on how corporations have taken actions to align their policy engagements with the goals of the Paris Agreement. And Dom will also give us a sense of the evolving global landscape on this front and talk about the vision of the We Mean Business Coalition. So let's open it up with you, Marcella, a warm welcome to you. Thanks very much and hello everyone. I'm very pleased to be here with you uh, all the way from Brooklyn, New York. I'm the Director of Sustainable Investing at Zevin Asset Management, where I lead our ESG integration and our advocacy work. Terrific, thanks so much, Marcella. Now, in the two, 2021 proxy season, we saw six proposals on climate lobbying go to vote. Five of them received majority votes. This past year, we had a total of 46 resolutions filed on climate lobbying, and 22 of those were either withdrawn because, of course, there was an agreement, or they went to a vote. These outcomes seem to suggest that the investor community is really getting increasingly engaged on the issue of climate lobbying, misalignment, possible reputational risk. This is crucial to our members. What do you see? Can you just describe for us why you see misaligned corporate lobbying, particularly on climate, as an investment risk? Absolutely. And um, I'll highlight some of our views that I think are shared by many investors here and indeed companies that uh, are diligently working to align their climate strategy with uh, their public affairs activities. So number one, the lack of visibility into how companies are behaving when it comes to the public policy space presents risks of uncertainty. Access to how companies assess themselves and how they make decisions about important and consequential state or federal global legislations, 
that gives investors information to determine for themselves if the company they invest in is on track uh, to meet our climate goals or not, and whether that is costing shareholders. So lack of visibility is a huge risk to begin with. Also being at a regulatory disadvantage is not a good thing for the companies, for shareholders or stakeholders. Um, and regulatory disadvantage is, I think, one of the biggest issues where boards are um, really waiting uh, to act rather than being proactive. Um, that uh, sets a precedent for, um, for investors to uh, question uh, how uh, long-term or um, the, how far-reaching their climate strategy is. You mentioned reputational risk, and absolutely, in this status quo of greenwashing and um, exposing what is meaningful and not meaningful, authentic and not authentic, could really render the, the big spending that companies are doing on sustainability programs moot in the eyes of many. Um, also, litigation risk is real. Um, perhaps less so in the U.S. right now, but uh, witness the recent lawsuit uh, that was filed with Volkswagen by European pension funds, alleging that the automakers lobbying via its membership of automotive and business associations runs counter to its public messaging on the importance of a green transition. And finally, missed opportunities are a risk too. The opportunity costs from delay, from obstruction, or uh, unscrupulous misinterpretation of climate science by the trade associations and uh, other third-party groups that companies belong to, uh, they slow down the needed progress. And we need the opposite. We need speed and haste. Well, we could not agree more with you, and I love that you frame this as the uh, unscrupulous misinformation of science and, and misinterpretation of science that we're seeing. Um, you know, it's interesting, as you were speaking, I realized Siri started this work about 12 years ago, and at that time, of course, there was social media, but it was nothing like it is today. And when you talk about reputational risk, just at my breakfast table this morning, one of our corporate leaders <clears throat> who had a misstep in this regard uh, was really being trashed in a very open and public way. And I have no doubt that that particular company is assembling their PR team this morning to try to dig out from that um, error and their reputational problem they're facing. Talk a little bit about trade associations, if you would. You know, we in our report characterize this as indirect climate lobbying, and it would be good to understand investor expectations around company behavior with regard to their engagements with their respective trade associations. Can you say a little bit about that? Sure. Um, I think investor expectations are, are evolving. Um, as, as you mentioned, we have been engaged as investors uh, scrutinizing lobbying activities and political spending and uh, have as of recently placed a special emphasis on the climate issue uh, with climate lobbying proposals. So what we're asking now is for companies that, uh, and all companies do, belong to trade associations and um, you know state level uh, third party groups and social welfare organizations, they have not, uh, or for the most part, demonstrated that they have conducted an evaluation of how their corporate climate strategy as it is developing aligns or does not with how they conduct themselves in the public policy arena. So to us, this, this evaluation signals that boards of directors are in this with both feet. Um, there is There are, as we know, significant financial implications arising from that potential misalignment. And that's something that I think all of us on this call recognize. Um, I, I think it was interesting to see that um, SEC Commissioner Hester Pierce warned that the <clears throat> SEC uh, or ESG disclosure regime, as she called it, would result in, in public shaming of certain firms. Um, I think that there is more shame in um, belonging to trade associations and membership or, um, organizations that proselytize that um, ESG 
uh, is inconsistent with uh, their apparent view that um, the fossil fuel industry is a sustainable long-term strategy. Uh, to paraphrase uh, Nell Minow's uh, penned letter to Larry Fink, um, so you know we are asking companies uh, to disclose, not to shame them, but to advance uh, due diligence uh, in a more uh, robust way than just asking for disclosure. Um, and we have seen support from the SEC and proxy voting uh, shops in, in, in favor of, of more consistency and more transparency. Um, as, as, we, as we all know, uh, we have placed special attention on oil and gas, utilities and transportation, but now we're looking more extensively to tech, to industrials, to energy intensive companies that might have blind spots in their strategies and their uh, public affairs, banking, finance, um, information and communication services, and insurance are other industries where we think that there is this uh, potential misalignment, and we want to see how companies are going to act going forward. Well, I'm glad you characterize it as a blind spot, Marcella, because in fact, you know, we did this session a year ago, we featured a company that had done an audit of all of its trade association. And in some cases, they were unaware, both of the fact that they were a member of a trade association, and they were often unaware of the climate position that the trade association had taken. So, I mean, this kind of audit, this kind of review makes so much sense. I also appreciate that you mentioned Nell Minow's letter to Larry Fink. I don't know if any of my colleagues can dig that up and pop it into the chat. But of course, Nell Minow is a longtime friend and ally of Siri. She's an absolute standout corporate governance expert. And I think that that would be um, good reading for, for our listeners today. I want to give you a chance, Marcelo, to talk about the anticipated SEC climate disclo disclosure rule that we are all so preoccupied with. Is it your sense that the rule is going to result in increased interest um, and exploration on the part of companies? This is going to lead to increased scrutiny. Or what's your sense of the impact uh, once the proposed rule is promulgated? I think it's um, as 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 we know is it's being fought um, very hard um, for it not to be realized. Um, because of this um, potential shaming. Um, but this proposed rule, it's, it's called the Enhancement and St Standardization of Climate-Related Disclosures for Investors. It's shown that expectations are rising uh, for consistent, comparable, and decision-useful information. Uh, and they have shown that even uh, if companies issue reports, uh, that uh, the expectation is that the quality of those reports needs to go up. Um, so we are we are moving ahead to judging more by whether a company discloses or not to now what the quality of of those disclosures are. Um, there is consensus here. Big multinationals, including Apple and, and Hewlett Packard, um, numerous investors and coalitions like Series and ICCR all are backing more uh, more quality, more, more signal to the noise. Um, I mentioned Honeywell right now, and that, uh, Yamika, you might mention that too. Um, the report that was issued by Honeywell apparently was not meeting investor expectations, and that uh, resolution was filed once again in 2022 and did receive support from the proxy voting um, uh, shop uh, ISS and the the proposal received a thirty nine point uh, five uh, percent uh, support. Um, so that's that's also another signal. Um, Yamika will expand on on her excellent analysis here. You know, one company out of the hundred and four that were assessed in in this report acknowledged that a lack of robust climate policy is a risk to them. Uh, that I found disheartening. Um, the respite here is that we also learn in the report that half of the companies in the S&P 100 have stated that they are developing climate transition plans. So now as we watch these plans unfold, as we see the SEC uh, probably, hopefully coming forward with a finalized rule, now it's our job, in my view, 
as active investors to watch how this will unfold, to unpack and scrutinize those plans, and then to come back to the table. Um, I think this is just good portfolio management and due diligence. Uh, and, and in terms of the institutional investors, uh, it's their job to vote. We need to get out of our own way uh, when it comes to um, you know these reports and and how robust they are and and how full of um, uh, fluff or or not. I want to quote Nell Minow one more time. She said one uh, a long time ago. She said boards are like subatomic particles. They behave differently when they're being observed, and knowing they're being observed will make a difference. So I think that once the SEC begins to provide clarity and, and the, the, the fighting hopefully stops, that we can really move forward with more effective public policy making on the, on the positive end also. Well, thank you so much for that dynamite quote. That is a tweetable quote. That is our first tweetable quote of, of this session. <laughs> if you're hearing this live, get it out She's on great. Twitter. If you're listening to this later, that's absolutely brilliant. Um, thank you so much, Marcella. And as you reference the SEC rule, I think we're going to have you back. I mean, Ceres is certainly going to be doing plenty of briefings once that rule is published. And you're right that we are going to be looking for quality over quantity uh, disclosures. Um, I want to just touch on one other question before we move on. And it goes to the... Um, the standard launched back in March with a group of NGOs, including Ceres, um, launched the global standard on climate lobbying. And I'm wondering how you see this framework bridging the various investor expectations on climate lobbying. You know, is it adequate? Do you feel that it's having an impact? Any thoughts on the global standard? Well, I hope Dominic um, will add more uh, depth and elegance to what I shared, but I, I definitely, we at Zevin Asset Management are a global investor. Uh, we benchmark against the ACWI. Um, so we have a very global view of how companies behave uh, and where they're operating, where are they generating revenue. Uh, we know that um, companies that uh, have a lot of influence in smaller countries or countries with less infrastructure uh, that they need to step up. Uh, so in countries like Mexico uh, or Latin America, some countries in Europe, there is uh, less of, a, of a, a stringency here on lobbying. And perhaps it's not even called lobbying. Um, it's, it's legalized corruption. Um, I can say that being from Latin America, that um, there is a lot of work to be done in not just U.S. policy, but having companies opt to use their own standards where standards are not as high as the companies. And that's saying a lot. So I think that is an expectation that, uh, that an expectation and a benefit of the global standard that we're looking at global behaviors when it comes to climate, um, but in a, in a very, very local sense, because every country has their you know nationally determined um, uh, contributions, I think. And the companies need to cater to what those are. I think the lobbying standards will help us shine more light um, in a in a more uh, you know location based way um, across all geographic regions where they where they operate. Well, you're so right. And I do want to pick up this global conversation later with Dom, because we do need to look at this in a, in a global context and lobbying techniques vary in different places. So you're, you're so right to underscore that. Marcella, I'm going to ask you to stick around because we're going to sure. be posing questions to you. Thank you so much. This was really helpful um, to get the investor view. A pleasure. I look forward to the rest of the conversation. Terrific. Thank you. All right, now I'm going to welcome my colleague Yumika on screen. Uh, Yumika is going to give us some of the um, overall findings of the report. Yumika works with our series accelerator team, and she's going to share some of the highlights of your report. And let me just also remind you that we'd love to get your questions in the Q&A. By the way, including on that global standard that Marcella just referenced, we've heard anecdotally that some of you as companies have had a hard time with that standard. Let us know why, what's working, what's not working. We want to hear from you. Um, but first, a welcome to you, Yumika. We're anxious to hear what you have to tell us and to look at your slides. Thank you so much, Anne. 
Um, so I'm going to kick off our, uh, our session with a quick background on the report. Um, so back in 2020, the team at the time engaged in a private consultation um, with uh, corporate and investor stakeholders to to develop this blueprint on responsible policy engagement, you know, so what does that look like for companies, what are investor expectations. Um, and so they came out with four key recommendations. So the first is to look at the climate related risks to the company, um, including the physical and transition risks, uh, you know, setting those targets to to address and mitigate the climate risks that are that are posed to a company. The second is to systematize decision making for climate risks. So looking at the governance systems that are in place, how the decisions are being made um, about these risks that are um, that are you know, prevalent um, on, on climate change, including climate lobbying. The third to advocate in favor of these Paris Align climate policies. So making statements directly in favor of specific policies, whether that is on a uh, state level, a regional level, a federal level. And then finally, engaging directly with their trade associations um, to support Paris aligned climate policies and, and to be aligned between their statements on climate change and, and that of their trade associations. So in 2021, uh, we published our first benchmark and um, it was, uh, accessible through a web tool with um, a very comprehensive database where it was 96 of the S&P 100 companies um, and it was reduced due to some mergers and acquisitions and users could see how each of the companies had fared on the various metrics and how the overall breakdown was across these four categories. And so this year, we published an updated web tool, um, which again, you can um, access the individual company performances and how they fared on each of the metrics. And then also it's broken down by each of the categories as well. And then in addition, we published a report in which we uh, just dive into some of the key trends and leading practices that the analysis uncovered. Um, and we partnered with um, some of our you know, key data providers like CDP and, and Influence Map um, to access some of the trove of knowledge that they've, um, you know, gathered on company performance on climate change and especially lobbying. Um, so uh, if we can move on to the next slide, please. So one of the key takeaways from this year's report was that the majority of companies that we looked at are, um, incorporating the right systems to manage their climate risk and have the governance mechanisms in place to make decisions about those risks, but they are not necessarily translating that into their uh, direct lobbying efforts and um, especially their indirect lobbying efforts and how they're engaging with their trade associations. So as you can see on the graphic on the screen, um, the majority of companies in the cohort are acknowledging the material risks that are arising from climate change. They are affirming that climate change is a reality. Um, they are charging their boards with overseeing decisions made on climate change. And, you know, even 50% of companies have lobbied directly on um, a specific climate policy. So that's pretty significant. If you look at the breakdown, that's about half of the largest companies in the United States are saying that, yes, we support specific legislation to mitigate the effects of climate change. But um, if we look at the bottom half of the graph, you see that 92% of companies have not completed a trade association alignment report. Um, so, you know, there's still a lot of murkiness in terms of what these trade associations are lobbying on, um, which again is, is a risk to those companies given that it's corporate funds that are going towards being members of these trade associations. Um, we still have about a third of companies that are lobbying against these climate policies. Um, so again, you know, if we if companies do want to be aligned and consistent in their statement on climate change, then it's necessary to reduce that number to zero. Um, and a very tiny percentage of companies have acknowledged that their trade associations are engaging in some obstructive climate lobbying. So for the purposes of our report, we analyzed um, companies that are, or sorry, memberships of the US Chamber of Commerce and the Business Roundtable, just given their um, record on, on previous climate legislation and also um, how wide the representation of the 
companies in the benchmark is of the membership. It's about three quarters of companies are me members of both the Business Roundtable and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Um, so, you know, it's it's pretty significant to see that the majority of companies have not acknowledged that those trade associations were not in favor of um, the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act or, you know, some of the aspects of um, reconciliation last year. Um, and then only 3% of the companies in the benchmark have disclosed that they've taken some kind of action to engage with their trade associations to influence their position. So again, a lot, a lot of progress that can be made um, in, in that area specifically. And if we can move on to the next slide, I'll just wrap it up really quickly. Um, so just so you can see the breakdown um, of how companies fared on the indicators that were static from 2021 to 2022. The majority of companies have shown improvement in um, in terms of assessing those climate risks and uh, the governance practices. So as you can see, 93% um, of companies have acknowledged the materiality of climate change or the risk, sorry, that's arising from climate change. Um, and, you know, three quarters of the companies are addressing both physical and transition risks. Um, and then if we look at the number of companies that have assigned formal oversight to uh, to their to their board committees, it's uh, 92 percent. So, again, pretty significant chunk have done so. Um, and we're also seeing improvement in the number of companies that have specifically referenced the risks that arise from climate change in these governance guidelines or board charters. So uh, it's almost half of the companies in the cohort. Um, and next slide, please. So, again, um, we see that. For the most part, companies have shown improvement in terms of their uh, support for um, international agreements like the Paris Agreement and, and general climate policies and even direct advocacy. But again, there's like a, a slight increase in the advocacy against climate policy, so not exactly where we should be going. Um, and then we have seen like a, an increase in the number of companies that have done that internal trade association assessment, but again, not where we would like to be. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for listening in. Um, we will drop the link for the report and the database in this chat so you have access to it. Uh, do let us know if you have any questions. We'll be answering those in the Q&A later on, and I will pass it back to Anne. Well, thanks so much, Yamika, and, and we are looking forward to the discussion. I just, Yamika, you spent a lot of time with this data, and you know the report from last year and from this year, and I'm just wondering if you can highlight what do you think is most significant in terms of, of improvement? And, you know, series, as we know, we're all about amplifying leadership, encouraging improvement. Um, what do you think is most significant between the two years? I definitely think it's the increase in companies that are directly advocating for these uh, specific policies, you know, so um, some of the heavy hitters like we had uh, Salesforce saying that we are in favor of the proposed climate rule that the SEC is is working on. Um, we had LinkedIn saying that they, oh, sorry, not LinkedIn. Uh, we had Netflix saying on LinkedIn that they are in favor of um you know, part of the provisions that were in reconciliation. So I think these actions like that are really significant given the, the brand power and um, just overall, you know, heavy hitters that these companies are. Um, so they're really showing some, some leadership that we would like to see all companies take. Well, that's terrific. And, you know, I would just say that you've highlighted a couple of key examples. We have many, many examples, some who are not part of the Fortune 100, but in the broad landscape of companies. Um, we have many companies who stood up. Um, and we're going to keep talking about those and other ways that companies can express their leadership. Thank you, Yamika. I'm going to turn to my colleague, Dominic, for a moment, and we're going to get a little bit of the global perspective. Welcome to you, Dom. Hi, and hi, everyone. So good to see you. Dominic, I'm wondering, just for those who aren't familiar with the We Mean Business Coalition, and by the way, um, Ceres is a proud member of We Mean Business. We have been since about 2014. Can you just describe what the coalition is and then zero in particular on the coalition's vision on the responsible policy engagement front? Yes, happy to. Hi, everyone. Dominic Gogol. I'm the Deputy Director for Policy at the We Mean Business Coalition. Uh, the Women Business Coalition are a coalition of seven business focused uh, groups, uh, and they include um, Ceres, as Anne said, but also uh, CDP, uh, BSR, um, COG Europe, 
climate group, the B team, and WBCSD. And what this coalition uh, of groups has come together was is to accelerate corporate climate action to half emissions by 2030 and to um, meet uh, net zero by 2050. Now, the question is kind of how we do it and how we organize our work across business groups and the thousands of businesses that we work with is on um, is by looking at ambition, action, advocacy, and accountability. So I'll unpack those in terms of ambition. That's the ambition that companies set by setting science-based targets or by um, joining the SME Climate Hub if they're a small or medium uh, enterprise. And then it's the action element, which is how companies uh, reduce their emissions through their direct operations, but also through their supply chains. And that could be joining one of the, um, the great hundreds campaign that the climate group uh, run uh, so successfully on renewable electricity or on electric vehicles, or it could be joining action collaboratives um, with different groups uh, in different sectors that BSR, series, and other groups, um, other groups manage. And then it's about once companies have set targets and they're delivering against them, it's then advocating, it's then spotting the opportunities of where engaging policy processes could enable companies to deliver further or to lift the floor to ensure all within their sector are reducing emissions and taking advantage of the um, opportunities in the clean energy economy. Uh, and finally, it's on um, accountability. So that's how companies disclose their emissions. Um, and whether that's on advocacy or the direct um, emissions for scope one, two, and three. Now, I want to specifically go a bit more detail into the advocacy element, because I think that's an area which we've uh, talked about and heard so well from the earlier speakers and thinking about how we can enable companies uh, to advocate and particularly how we can enable more companies to advocate, but how we can enable more companies to advocate consistently on their climate targets, because we've seen fantastic growth now in the number of um, companies committing to the science-based target initiative. It's passed 4,000 now at COP27. But we need to see that being mainstreamed across the company's operations to their public affairs, to their legal teams and to their board in terms of how they externally communicate uh, to policymakers, whether that's directly or as we've been talking about also through their trade associations. So what we uh, at We Mean Business, along with working with um, a series, are specifically looking at creating a framework for company that enables them to advocate more consistently. And we'll kind of structure that in a similar way to how we in business uh, manages its work in terms of uh, by looking at kind of how companies commit to speak up. And so therefore that's how they mainstream their climate commitment across their operations and across their, uh, their functions. So they're all on the same page when they're engaging with policymakers, whether that's at different state levels in the US, whether that's federally in the US, but that's also in terms of how they engage policymakers in different geographies, internationally, or where their operations lie in Europe uh, with about their customers or where their supply chains might be in Asia, Africa, or other geographies. Um, and so that's the second part, which is how you make your voice heard. And that's how, what is best practice for companies to advocate? How do they join groups of fellow um, companies who are advocating? And that's on all different aspects of climate policy. So that's on uh, emission standard for vehicles in the US, or that could be electricity renewables targets in Europe. And about how they join the different groups that we within the Meaning Business Coalition work with uh, to advocate for most progressive climate policy. Um, the third aspect of the, um, the framework that we're building is about how companies uh, engage their trade associations. Now, I think we've talked a lot about engaging trade associations, and some companies are more um, comfortable with doing that and frankly know how to. Others are less comfortable. They're just working out who all their trade associations are that they have across their operations and across their supply chains. And these can span multiple geographies of where they're less the less understanding of how many trade associations they're a member of in Indo Indonesia, for example. So part of it is about kind of research and delving into company supply chains, but it's also providing companies the tools, the template letters to engage trade associations and saying, we now have a science-based target, we're delivering against it. And so when you advocate on our behalf to policymakers, you need to be doing it from this perspective. And once that's being done across multiple companies, that begins how, that's how you start moving trade associations so they accurately reflect their members. Uh, and the final piece is both looking at um, advocacy spend. So that's how companies um, spend on whether it's corporate lobbyists, whether it's communications firms, and that's directly in-house, but also how that's done externally through professional service providers. 
and ultimately bringing this all together in terms of how companies disclose on their corporate climate advocacy um, and who that's done to what's best practice. Uh, that's the piece of work which we're looking uh, to develop next year um, with Ceres and with others. And I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. I didn't want any background noise. Um, tremendous amount of information. Thanks so much. And I'll invite you to put anything in the chat if you'd like to, to walk our listeners through that. But I, I really like the four A's that you outlined. And I want to zero in on the first one for just a moment, which was ambition. And I want to acknowledge that your former executive director, Nigel Topping, formerly with Mimi Business, then over to the UN, said to me once that even setting that target, ideally in line with this science-based targets initiative, setting the target sends a political signal. And I want to acknowledge that when companies step out and they make an aggressive target, they make a public commitment, that that is a political signal in and of itself. The problem is that if they then take actions that are in direct contradiction with actually meeting that target, that's where you know we run into problems. And Dominic, I wonder if this is wonderful that you've blown this up into a global context. I'm wondering if you have any examples that you can cite where business leadership actually impacted uh, a given policy in a particular jurisdiction. And while you're thinking about that, I just want to remind our guests that you're welcome to pop questions into the Q&A, and we will be tackling those after I finish talking with Dominic, and we really do want to hear from you. So, Dominic, any examples that you can offer in any jurisdiction where the effectiveness of the collective business voice really came through? Absolutely. And no, I think there are several great cases of that, particularly recently, as the role of corporate climate advocacy has really grown. Obviously, there's the, the one that me and you both like to talk about, which is the US NDC uh, campaign, where 408 companies in the end were mobilized uh, to uh, calling on um, the US government's assessment at least 50% target. But I think I, it's important, I want to bring examples of where this is not just um, uh, a great example of corporate climate advocacy in the US. There are other examples in other geographies. Um, we, our partner at the Japanese uh, Partnership for Climate Leadership, JCLP, had a similar type of um, initiative where they had 189 major Japanese um, businesses write to the Japanese Prime Minister at the time and ask for both an enhanced uh, renewables electricity target and uh, they asked for over 38% and asking for a national uh, Japanese decarbonization target of 46 to 50 percent and ultimately this was brought into law by the Japanese government in a very similar type of um, uh, engagement pattern that we saw in the US and there actually there's a very recent example I'd like to raise which was at COP27 uh, the Women Business Coalition um, identified and had heard concerns from scientists and negotiators in Sharm El Sheikh that a 1.5 as a as a target that we needed to be focusing climate attention and climate policy and ambition uh, was under threat or, or was possibly not going to be in the final COP outcomes or at the, uh, the G20 Leaders Summit. And we, in a very short amount of time, in terms of a number of days, we pulled together uh, 200 businesses and business groups uh, to talk to uh, advocate that 1.5 was still the target to which they were delivering in terms of their science-based targets, but they that they wanted policymakers to continue to focus attention on because the importance of 1.5 is both a target in terms of uh, maximizing ambition on policy for mitigation, so that the emissions, but also ensuring that that means that we have to adapt less. And that means that the most vulnerable in society and the vulnerable communities and countries suffer less of the expensive and hugely damaging consequences of climate change. Well, thanks so much for that hot off the press example, uh, Dominic, and I'd invite any of my colleagues to pop that letter in the chat. What was stunning about that was just short time frame within about 48 hours you had 200 companies stand up to keep 1.5 alive and i'll just offer that many of those were our colleagues and taking in an, a collective action like that is only positive it makes your investors happy there was no negative impact for any uh advocacy on that front and that just goes to our overall theme that again we're encouraging leadership we're making climate leadership easy and um 
you know, appropriate for companies. You're doing that on a global scale, Dominic, which is really important. I want to ask you about the responsible policy engagement global standard that we referred to earlier um, that several investors have put together. That's an important framework. Obviously, Ceres has talked about a, a framework through our blueprint. What's your sense, and I, and, and I know you're now initiating this task force, um, do you sort of see the various standards converging? And is there a way to do that in a way that incorporates the different lobbying practices? I say lobbying in quotes around the world. I mean, Mar Marcella referred to corruption. Some people wine and dine lawmakers. Is there a way that we can do this and have a standard that's applicable to companies in all jurisdictions, knowing that the nature of persuasion and political persuasion is going to vary from place to place? Can we come up with something you think that is universally applicable? Yes, no, absolutely. We convened a roundtable with companies at Com uh, COM27 uh, earlier this month that specifically uh, talked through the global standard uh, and talked through um, how companies were were kind of re wrestling the wrong word, how they were engaging with it. Uh, and most companies were, were broadly in favour of um, the global standard, but what they were wrestling with was uh, how they could would meet it and understanding in terms of their own operations how they were being graded against the criteria uh, by their investors and by uh, by other groups so i think that kind of dovetails very nicely with the piece of work which which we want to look at which is uh, aggregating the tools available to companies to meet the criteria under the global standard and so that's how companies engage their trade associations that's how, what is best practice uh, in terms of internal alignment between different teams within a company um, it can take kind of multiple different um, uh, forms but it's about aggregating those into a single um, framework which is then socialized with companies is what we see would be real um, real benefit and also uh, tested with companies i think there needs to be there's a strong um, need for independence when it comes to climate advocacy to ensure um, kind of accountability, but there's also there is need for engaging with companies as this is created to make sure that uh, this is a tool uh, and these are tools that can be used by companies and will benefit them and ultimately benefit um, all of us active in kind of climate um, advocacy. Um, and I think how this will benefit, I think internationally it will, is kind of very clear uh, uh, that this this problem is not unique uh, to the US, that this type of climate advocacy, uh, there are similar issues that uh, I know were mentioned earlier with the US Chamber and the Business Roundtable have also happened in Brussels uh, with aspects of the EU Fit for 55 package and the role of different companies and trade groups trying to undermine different parts of it. Um, and likewise, as I mentioned earlier, in, in Japan. So I think the need for aggregating these tools across geographies, first in terms of a a global standard that we can we can point to and we can have tools for companies to work with but also thinking this is probably further down the line about how do we apply this uh in different geographies and how do we apply this in different sectors so what's uh, what's an appropriate rpe framework for the european auto manufacturers or what would be the appropriate rpe framework uh for the u.s steel sector for example so i think this is the type of work which we want to look to develop further but needs that kind of richer understanding to really have more impact well, overall, Dominic, I must say you sound pretty optimistic. Um, are you, in fact, optimistic that we can come up with a standard that will transcend jurisdictions and sectors and actually start to shift the paradigm around the climate, climate misalignment that we see right now? Uh, yes, I am. And, and that is not just because uh, I had a naturally optimistic person. That's also feeding through from the great response that we've had the companies that we engage is that they have a real appetite to engage on this. They can see uh, the issues which they've had in terms of whether it's themselves within their company or across their sector or in different geographies. And they see the need now that it needs collectively, we need to raise the bar. And the only way that can be done is kind of independently, but in close Kind of contact with business on how this can be done best and for it to be done in a, in a public manner so they kind of so uh, so it can be done kind of with the to really improve public practices and how it engages policymakers well terrific and, and let me thank you dominic because your partnership with us is really enabling us to see this in a broader context and we're dealing with multinational companies and investors here and and i'm so grateful for your work and looking forward to working with you uh, in the coming year 
All right, let's bring the whole panel back. Now we're gonna to get to your questions and I invite you again to put questions in the Q&A if you weren't able to do that yet, there's still time. If you have questions about a particular jurisdiction or a particular sector, by all means, um, let's engage there. I'm gonna start with you, Marcel. I'm gonna take a look at some of these questions, but first I wanna get a little bit granular because we kicked off with what investors are looking for. And I wonder if you can get a little bit specific about what you're looking for when uh, investor brings a shareholder proposal, what is the product they're specifically going to be looking for from a company? What do you think led to those withdrawals I referred to earlier? And um, what should companies anticipate being asked by their investors so that they can comply and, and give the investor the assurance that there is no reputational risk based on their activities? So um, on one hand, we have the disclosure ask, right? Um, we need the disclosure of uh, companies' trade association memberships and um, where the money's going. It's been as true as ever that uh, you need to follow the money. And that's, again, um, not an attack on, you know, the sustainability teams uh, at companies to to set them up, but it's more to understand where are the money where is the money going um because all companies belong to groups that lobby on all sorts of business issues but it's important to differentiate the business issues that they uh claim uh, uh compels them to belong to these trade associations and other groups and their stance on climate. Um, if a trade association or membership group has not articulated uh, their stance, uh, as a member, a uh, company can and should, in our view, ask what, what is the positioning? How does this benefit us? Um, and how does it not? And that is a conversation I think that we encourage companies to have internally and articulate themselves. Well, what is our position? Um, and that's that's what we are all doing with asking companies and, and uh, companies themselves developing their climate transition plans. Well, now, if you look at your direct and indirect, indirect uh, lobbying activities, how does it all um, even out? Uh, how how many of these trade associations and groups are actively lobbying? We know some of the obvious ones, but which ones might benefit from member scrutiny? Um, and, and I think that's a very healthy thing to do. Um, so the amounts paid at a state level, it's, it's very, very important. Um, that's the disclosure side. And then on the you know, the 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 process side, we want to understand how board oversight really translates into action uh, because we have on one hand the you know direct reports uh, of the climate teams to the board but then perhaps the public affairs folks um, are not talking with the sustainability teams or perhaps they are um, not in agreement uh, every corporate culture is different every team is different um, I would encourage companies to come to us or come to series to engage with us. I think I saw a question related on the chat of how do we actually do this? Um, it is work, but that this is where the work is um, to really unpack, um, assess, and and then cite or, or articulate what is going to change? What do we do when there is a misalignment? And if a company can say, we, you know, something beyond the, the typical canned language that we hear, which is, well, we belong to this group because they lobby on so many other issues. Well, when we're talking about climate, the most existential threat to our society right now, well, how are you um, decoupling that argument from the climate crisis argument. Um, so I think those two are, are the, the basic um, fundamental tenets of, of what we're all here to do is disclosure and then understand um, oversight process and, and subsequent action. 
That makes perfect sense. And I do want to allude to the question in the chat. I think it's genuine. And I suspect other people share this. Uh, the person has said, I hope you can help us coach us on how to do audits of our trade associations. We have many, and I'm not sure how easy it will be to find out what stance they're taking with their lobbying efforts. So happy to, to hear from any of the three of you uh, answers to that question. But Marcel is getting at something else that I think um, we have to look at, which is what recommendations do we have for internal coordination between the government affairs team, the finance team, the sustainability team, so that they can really be aligned when it comes to understanding what positions the companies should take. Any thoughts on either of those things from any of you? Jump in, go ahead, Dominic. Um, in terms of the recent discussions that we've heard with companies, I think there's probably multiple ways of doing it, uh, which more appropriate to different company cultures. One example that we've heard that's been very successful is the creation of a public policy um, position for a company on climate. Uh, and by uh, aligning internally on a public position, getting buy-in from different teams, but also having that published on a company website, engaged with trade associations and lawmakers that a company is involved with, you you put that out there, you're kind of holding yourself to that. And that's both publicly, but that's also internally within a company is to say, this is this is what we stand for now, this is what we're delivering um, against. And that has had real benefit from getting buy-in from across uh, companies. And we've heard that from multiple sectors um, and, and from different geographies. So we definitely hold that up as one example uh, for any companies considering on how to improve their alignment on that. An excellent example. Um, you know, Marcella, there's a really specific question here that I just want to ask because I think it's on the mind of several others, which is, is there evidence of improved pricing of debt or equity for companies that take climate issues seriously? And I don't know if there is, but I've certainly been asked that question before, and I wonder if you have an answer. I think there is now a pretty years-long track record that shows that companies with more uh, or better managed um, a, a climate strategy, energy, natural resources, human resources, that those companies are more apt to get uh, more access to credit. Um, and banks have, like ING have set incentives for um, borrowers to um, to fulfill certain sustainability expectations, but some of them are already there. So they get a benefit of a, a, a better rate. Um, and I, I could look this up, but off the top of my head, I know that there is a wealth of um, accumulated evidence that there is more, more and better access to, to credit than uh, those companies that um, perhaps have not you know, extended their management to their natural resources and, and human resources. Well, thank you for that. I think there'd be great interest if there was any any specific data that we can share, and we can also do that um, as a follow-up. Patrick's question is a good one as well. Are there a list of companies that we think are sustainability ESG leaders that we can share? And this is a list that, that varies, and it, it certainly depends on various criteria. But if there's anything we can share that's up to date and comprehensive, happy to put that out as a follow-up. But I want to zero in on Nicole's question too, which is a really good one. You know, do companies know their trade associations well enough to know what their tactics are? Many times their voting procedures are opaque, and it's very difficult sometimes for a company to know, well, am I getting my return on investment here because I'm not sure they're representing me? And I would take recommendations from any of the, four, the three of you about what a company should do when they have those kind of core questions. They're a paying member of an association um, you know, what should they do up front to make sure that they're not being misrepresented? I think a lot of companies face this, and this might be globally as well, Dom. I don't think this is just in the U.S. No, certainly not. Um, I think we would uh, encourage any company to look at the B-Team trade group misalignment toolkit that they've created, and that gives a series of template letters for companies to use to ask their trade association. Realistically, you're starting a dialogue with your trade association saying you don't have a climate target. How, what is the trade group's uh, climate target or kind of climate position? How do they advocate on behalf of it? How do they use lobbying tactics? And you begin a kind of a back and forth dialogue to better understand that both for kind of clarity based reasons, but also to understand whether or not the trade group is willing to listen uh, to a company who's, and in often 
trade groups don't necessarily know what all their companies' positions are. If you're being uh, open-minded to how trade groups operate, they uh, and therefore better informing trade group decision-making bodies about what a company's position is could hopefully shift them in the kind of right way. Yeah, I think that makes perfect sense. Um, anyone else? I I am not so familiar with the upkeep of the um, the. EDF's um, climate authenticity meter, but it might be useful for um, for you all, anyone who is curious about this, um, how companies are performing. I'll I'll add the link in the in the chat for that. And look, if I if I'm an executive in in a sustainability team at a company where um, there is this question. I think the work is in tracking down, um, you know, that percentage of spending that goes out. Um, and it's perhaps somewhere in the foundation because sometimes there is foundation money that flows um, out um, to, um, to, you know, uh, the unaligned uh, climate actions from third parties. Uh, but I think that there needs to be a, a strict documentation of how spending goes out. And that certainly will um, encourage investors uh, to know that their shareholder money is being spent, um, you know, wisely and, and prudently and intentionally. Absolutely. Yes. Three key criteria there, Marcella. Yamika, I'm just wondering, can you share a couple of examples from the recent RPE benchmark of companies that actually were consistent between the statements they made on climate change and, and their policy advocacy? Um, is this showing up in, in given sectors? Are, you know, are there particular examples that, that leap to mind for you based on this recent analysis? Yeah, sure. Um, so I would like to call out uh, the companies that are part of the uh, U.S. Chamber's Climate Solutions Working Group. So it's uh, an unofficial group of companies that came together to say, hey, we don't like the position that you're taking. And um, this is our statement saying that we think you should change the way that you're engaging on um, on climate policy. You know, so like a lot of the big companies like American Express, Bank of America, um, City, Morgan Stanley. Um, so a lot of you know, financial firms that we're seeing here um, published a statement last year in which they said that they are in support of these uh, climate policies that are, you know, facilitating the low carbon transition. Um, and then we also had, you know, General Motors publish a public policy supplement in which they listed um, the memberships that they held to trade associations that were engaging on climate policy with details on um, any positions that they've taken uh, and they, as in the trade association, has taken on climate change, whether there is alignment between um, the company and the trade association, and if there is misalignment, what are like the specific actions that have been taken to kind of mitigate that misalignment? Great examples, and um, this conversation could go on for a very long time. I'm regretting that we are going to have to close. Let me uh, first off thank uh, Yamika, Marcella, and Dominic for their terrific contributions and also for their work in this space every day. Uh, we will be sending you a follow-up note and we will highlight many of the resources that have been offered today. There are several links that we can put forward that help you go deeper, including our own series uh, RPE blueprint in addition to the most recent analysis, the B-team analysis that Dominic referred to and more information on what We Mean Business is doing on this front. So we really appreciate that. I just want to underscore the fact that, you know, series is in this to promote leadership. We really want to encourage courage. We want to create a safe place, a big tent for companies and investors to be leaders in climate action. And this is one of the hurdles we've identified is climate lobbying misalignment. But our goal is very much to point people in the right direction. And we're going to continue to keep offering those platforms for you all to weigh in positively. So do stay tuned. I want to just thank you all for um, joining today's session. And just a couple of points before we conclude.
Uh, let's see. After a three-year hiatus, um, Series Global Conference will be returning to New York City in March of 2023. We'll be hosting several sessions on the role that corporate and investor communities can play in advocating for policies. We'll have a number of interesting policy sessions, and we're going to specifically include a session on trade association engagement. So stay tuned. More to come on this front. I really hope to see uh, all of you in New York. And finally, we would greatly appreciate your feedback on this session. What can we do better? What questions can we answer more fully? You can access a participant survey through the QR code shown on the slide. We'd really appreciate your feedback and know that, as I said before, you are all going to be receiving a follow-up email with a link to the recording of this session and to a number of resources that are going to allow you to explore this area more fully. And we look forward to this ongoing, crucially important conversation. Thanks so much to all of you for joining us today.